Well, let's begin. <clears throat> I'm a little slow today. I'm sorry about that. My voice sounds a little strange, too. Um, not sure what's going on. Anyways, let me share my screen. I shouldn't have a cold. I haven't been around anyone. Uh, so today is April 27th and we will be starting chapter 4. Uh, take a look at the quiz this week. It will be covering uh, chapter 3 and the end of chapter 2 as well as uh, lab modules 3 and 4. Any questions about that? And then this week we will have two labs, one on Tuesday and one on Thursday. Uh, am I recording? Yes, I think so. Okay, thank you. Just wanted to make sure. Um, let's begin. I think I've already got that open. We started this chapter, didn't we? Yeah. So we had talked about this slide here. Let me delete that. Showing you the uh, typical structure of a prokaryotic cell. Uh, the glycocalyx is not found on all prokaryotic cells. We're really only talking about the bacteria. Uh, the gly glycocalyx or glycocalyx, both pronunciations are correct, is an external secretion made by the cell and it's outside the cell wall. It's usually sticky and there's three types of glycocalyxes. If it's neatly organized, we call it a capsule. And a capsule can be seen under the light microscope. Uh, capsules are important because they can prevent phagocytosis, and that means that a patient has a much harder time throwing off a bacterial infection that has a capsule. For example, strep throat is a disease that uh, people get, and it used to be a very serious disease before antibiotics because there was no effective way to treat it. And uh, it's really hard to throw off. The strep throat, usually when a child gets it, uh, it just gets worse and worse and worse. And, uh, you know, the parents eventually take them into the doctor and, uh, we find out that it's strep throat. Now it's easy to treat. You just treat it with antibiotics. Uh, the second type of a glycocalyx is uh, called the slime layer. It's a loosely unorganized layer outside the cell wall, but it's mostly water. And that's why the light microscope cannot see it. Because it's mostly water, the light microscope can't see it. Uh, the third type of a glycocalyx is the extracellular polysaccharide uh, layer, or EPS. And this we find in biofilms. And we'll talk a little bit more about biofilms later in the term. Anyways, there's three different types of glycocalyxes and the capsule is the one we'll talk about the most because you can see it under the microscope. A slime layer, you can't see under the light microscope. You'd have to use an electron microscope to see it. And then we don't usually call the glycocalyx in a biofilm a glycocalyx. We call it a biofilm. And a biofilm is when bacteria 
are growing somewhere, and it can be more than one species. It usually is several species. And they put out a thick film coating that sticks them all together. And then the cells grow in the biofilm. And like I said, we'll talk a little bit more about biofilms later in the term. All right, any question about glycocalyxes? Hopefully you're hearing me all right. I didn't have that up where it should be. And this is falling off. All right. The flagella is another structure that is mostly external to the cell wall. If you look closely at the flagella, it is anchored in the cell wall and in the plasma membrane. But the majority of it is outside the cell wall. Flagellas, of course, are used for locomotion. They allow a cell to swim in a liquid media. It's made of chains of flagellin, which is a protein. Any question about any of that? I'm not going to quiz you on this, but we had it in the uh, lab. And <clears throat> there was a question, uh, what was the bacterial flagellar arrangement? And when you see more than one, you should always take the answer with the most, the highest flagellar arrangement, because the cells that are putting out flagella uh, maybe they're doing this, but given time they will become very trichous. So that's why I said always choose the highest arrangement you see when you're looking at one species. So flagella allow cells to swim in a liquid media or run or tumble. Uh, flagella allow cells to have taxis. Taxis is movement towards or away from a stimuli. There are two types of taxis. There's chemotaxis so taxis due to a chemical, and then there's phototaxis, taxis due to light. So here, I'm not sure why, but the uh, cell is moving away from the light source. If it was a photosynthetic organism, I would suspect it would move towards the light source. But this one seems to be moving away from the light source. Any question about taxis? Taxis is extremely important because it allows a cell to move towards a more favorable environment. A photosynthetic, photosynthetic organism will, of course, move to the top of the water so it could get more sunlight. Another structure that cells have for m moving is an axial filament. An axial filament is a flagella, but it's unusual in its structure. And so we don't call it a flagella, we call it an endoflagella. And why we call it an endoflagella is because this flagella is inside the cell wall. You find the end of flagella only in spirochetes, and they're anchored at one end of the cell and inside the cell wall. So here you're looking at it running through a spirochete, 
And this is an artist rendition. It's spiraling around the cell wall. And let me blow this up and get over to it. Put that at the top. You can see that there's actually two axial filaments and they're inside the cell wall. And you'll notice, sorry this thing keeps falling on me, you'll notice that uh, the cell wall is a little thicker wherever there's the endoflagella. The endoflagella, let me see if that link works. The endoflagella allows the cell to swim in a spirochete-like motion, which is a corkscrew-type motion. And you notice how the cell can change its direction. In fact, it changed 90 degrees here. And that's how the spirochetes can move. And they just have a corkscrew type motion that allows them to swim. Uh, this motion also allows human pathogens, which are spirochetes, to burrow through the mucous membranes. So uh, the endoflagella is a special flagella found in the spirochetes. Any question about that? Okay, Frimbrae are hair-like structures. They're shorter and straighter and thinner than flagella. They're not really used in movement. They are used for attaching to surfaces. So they're not used in swimming. Uh, it is true that the cell can attach to something and then um, like if it's attached to the auger plate, it can then retract the frimbriae, and that can allow the cell to move a little bit. But we're not going to talk about the frimbriae allowing the cell to move. Uh, it's used for attachment to surfaces. And they're just hair-like structures, and you can see there's many of them. The pili is similar to a frimbriae, but it's much longer. It's also hollow. And although we do call it a pili, uh, it's more often called a sex pili. And that's because this structure from this cell can skewer this cell and uh, we'll talk about these later. This is a, a F plus cell. This is an F minus cell. The structure can skewer these cells and then winch them together. They don't have to come directly together. And the structure is hollow and it allows a plasmid to move from this cell into that cell. And that's why it's called the sex pili. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later in the term. Any questions about the sex pili? Okay. So let's talk a little bit more about the cell wall. It's a complex, semi-rigid structure respons responsible for the cell's shape. The reason all uh, species have a particular shape 
is because of their cell wall. And that is true for uh, all bacteria. Their shape is dependent on their cell wall. The cells, there are, there is one family of bacteria that do not have cell walls and its uh, shape is pleomorphic and that's because it takes on different shapes because it doesn't have a cell wall. The complex semi-rigid cell wall protects the cell and prevents osmotic lysis. So when water moves into the cell, the uh, cell membrane can expand up into the point of the cell wall. Once the cell membrane hits the cell wall, no further water can come into the cell because the cell membrane can't expand anymore. Uh, that prevents the cell from undergoing osmotic lysis so that a bacteria cell dropped in a bucket of water will not lyse because it has a cell wall. And I'm talking about the bacteria that have a cell wall. If you were to drop your red blood cell into a bucket of water, water would enter the cell and continue entering the cell until the cell membrane would burst. Because red blood cells, and actually all animal cells, would lice because there is no cell wall to protect it. The cell wall is located outside the cell membrane. It does contribute to the pathogenicity of some species, meaning some species have molecules in the cell wall with her, which are pathogenic. Um, the mycobacterium are the species that uh, come to mind. Although there are antigens in some species of E. coli, which are in the cell wall as well, like uh, O157, H11, uh, those two molecules of that E. coli strain are pathogenic to human, and uh, those patho or at least those two antigens of O157 and H11 are uh, in the cell wall. Uh, the cell wall is made mostly of peptidoglycan in bacteria. Uh, peptidoglycan, as you recall, is not found in uh, archaeobacteria. We've looked at this before. Peptidoglycan is a polymer of repeating disaccharide. I don't think we've gone into that before, now that I think about it, but I don't remember. Uh, so, what we have and I think this is a better picture, is it's a, a disaccharide. So you start with NAM, and then you follow with NAG, and then you follow with NAM again, then you follow with NAG again, and then it repeats for the chain, a repeating disaccharide chain. Uh, NAG is in N-acetylglucosamine and NAM is in N-acetylmuramic acid. You can use either name. Most of you will use probably NAG and NAM. The disaccharide chain is hooked together with polypeptides forming a lattice sur uh, surrounding the cell. Let me get way over here. Here we go. So you can see that this chain here is connected to this chain here by that 
polypeptide. Didn't mean to move that. Let's move it back. There we go. And then this. There we go. We'll look at this one. This chain here is hooked together by this chain here by that polypeptide. And you'll notice that that polypeptide hooks to that polypeptide and that polypeptide. But the point of it is, is that that one holds this chain together to that chain together. So the polypeptides are holding the repeating polymers of uh, disaccharide together. Anyways, the uh, name peptidoglycan comes from the fact that uh, sugars, the NAG and the NAM, are glycans, and then uh, there are short peptide bonds linking the glycans together. So, peptidoglycan. Any question about the name? Um, penicillin actually acts, and that we're talking about every member of the penicillin family, by inhibiting the lattice formation of the peptidoglycan. So before this peptide gets made, penicillin can get in there and prevent it from being made. And then what does that do? That creates a hole in the cell wall, which the cell membrane can come out. And if there's a hole in the cell wall, then the uh, cell membrane isn't protected. And water can continue entering the cell, which will eventually burst the cell membrane because it keeps protruding further and further outside of the hole in the cell wall. And you can think of that as sort of like blowing up a balloon in a box. The balloon will um, proceed out of the hole in the box. And you can keep blowing the balloon until it pops. And that's how penicillin uh, kills bacteria cells is it inhibits the lattice formation, allowing for gaps in the cell wall. The cell membrane protrudes out of the gaps. Water continues moving into the cell, and then the cell eventually lyses. Any question about that? All right. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about the cell wall. There are two types of cell walls in actually all prokaryotic cells that have a cell wall. Uh, we're only going to be talking about the bacteria. Um, there are the gram-positive bacteria cell walls, and they have a very thick peptidoglycan layer it follows the cell membrane, the yellow one, very thick blue area with the cell wall. And it's more than three layers of peptidoglycan. The artist is just trying to show you that it's many layers, and he stopped drawing it at three. It's hundreds of layers of peptidoglycan. Okay? And I would have to look at an uh, electron microscopic image and try and count them or look at somebody who's done a count. And of course, different species have different thicknesses of their cell wall. The main molecule, of course, is peptidoglycan, but there are other molecules. There's tocoic acid, which runs through the peptidoglycan, 
and it kind of helps hold the pe peptidoglycan together. There's also li lipotechoic acid, which does run through the peptidoglycan, but there's a lipid portion attached to the tocoic acid, and it anchors into the cell membrane. Any question about that? Uh, the tocoic acids may help regulate the movement of cations through the cell wall. A cation is a positively charged ion and they're water soluble and anything that's water soluble can get through the cell wall but cations appear to uh, move down the tocoic acid. The polysaccharides can provide antigenic variation. So that some species will have different molecules. An antigen is just what our immune system responds to. Okay, so that was the gram-positive cells. Let's talk about the gram-negative cells, walls. It's a thinner cell wall. So there we have the cell membrane. And we do have a thin peptidoglycan layer. And on top of that layer, we have another lipid bilayer, which we call the outer membrane of the cell wall. Now, this artist is only showing one layer of peptidoglycan, and that he's doing because he wants it to be less than the gram-positive cells, which he only showed three layers, okay? It's much more than one layer of peptidoglycan. And this one I should look up, but I don't know how many layers of peptidoglycan is. Okay, I know that it's many. Uh, it's probably more than 10. Okay. It's not just one. So don't, you know, give in an answer that gram negative cells have one layer of peptidoglycan. Uh, it's, it's many, but it's much thinner and much fewer than the gram positive cells. There is a periplasm for the gram-negative cells, and that is where the peptidoglycan is found. The rest of the cell wall, which is external to the peptidoglycan, is a lipid bilayer. Let me blow that up. This molecule in the underside of the lipid bilayer is familiar to you. It should look familiar to you anyways, because what it is, is uh, phospholipid. And it's the sa same molecule that you find as the main molecule in the cell membrane. Of course, you do find other molecules in the cell membrane, particularly transfer proteins. You can find phospholipids in the outer layer of the bilayer of the outer membrane. Remember, the outer membrane is a bilayer. But you also find lipid A, which is that big blue molecule, in the outer layer. And then attached to the lipid A is an O polysaccharide. So that lipid A and the O polysaccharide together 
We call it a lipopolysaccharide. Lipid A is the important molecule because lipid A is an endotoxin. Toxins are molecules which are toxic to us. So if anyone ever gets a gram negative infection, they're going to have to deal with exposure to an endotoxin, a molecule which is toxic to us. Any question about that? This is the first time we'll talk about lipid A and endotoxins. We will be talking about it at two other times in the class. There is an important protein in the outer membrane of the cell wall. And this we call a porin protein. The porin protein allows molecules that the cell wants to enter the cell wall to enter. And it then allows molecules the cell wants to leave the outer membrane of the cell wall to leave the outer membrane of the cell wall. So the porin protein is allowing molecules to enter and leave this lipid bilayer. What molecules would the cell want to enter the uh, outer membrane of the cell wall? Well, molecules like glucose and fructose cannot get through this lipid bilayer. Also, all amino acids, uh, all carbohydrates. I'm trying to think of what else. Um, nucleotides, okay, cannot get through this lipid bilayer. And so it'll come through the porin protein. It's a channel protein. It allows many molecules to enter and then refuses other molecules entry. Now those molecules like glucose and fructose have to get through more than just the outer membrane. They also need to enter the cell membrane and how uh, they will enter the cell membrane is through a transport protein. A transport protein is different from the porin protein in, in that a transport protein is specific for one molecule. Like this protein would only allow fructose to enter the cell and this protein would only allow glucose to enter the cell so that the transport proteins in the cell membrane are molecule specific but the porin protein is not. Any question about any of that? Okay. Let's talk about some of the differences. Lipid A is the important part of the lipopolysaccharide and the important part of the outer membrane of the cell wall because lipid A is an endotoxin. All gram-negative cells have an outer membrane to their cell wall. They also have a very thin peptidoglycan layer. So in the gram-negative outer membrane, we find lipopolysaccharides, lipoproteins, and phospholipids. 
Here's a periplasm. The outer membrane of the gram-negative cell helps protect the cell from the complement protein. This is a protein that our bodies make to help defend ourselves and it can attack a foreign invader. And then the outer membrane also helps protect the gram-negative cell from uh, certain antibiotics. Like penicillin G, I'm surprised I didn't mention that, I meant to. Uh, penicillin G cannot get through the pore and protein. So penicillin G will not harm a gram-negative cell. And there's some other antibiotics that cannot get through the uh, outer membrane of a gram-negative cell. However, there are many antibiotics which can be used on gram-negative cells. For example, ampicillin, which was one of the early members of the penicillin family, does work on gram-negative cells because ampicillin can get through the outer membrane. It gets through the boron protein. We'll talk more about the uh, penicillin family. But for now, I just wanted to point out that uh, some antibiotics cannot get through and attack a gram-negative cell and then an other antibiotics can get through the gram-negative cell and then attack them. The gram-negative cells have an old polysaccharide antigen, and this is uh, an important molecule for some strains of E. coli. Like I mentioned, uh, O157, that is the old polysaccharide of this strain of E. coli. And this is a uh, toxic strain of E. coli, meaning this, this strain of E. coli causes human disease, human illness. That uh, O. polysaccharide antigen uh, interferes with phagocytosis, meaning the uh, white blood cells will have a harder time consuming uh, e. coli with this antigen. And then most importantly the gram-negative outer membrane has lipid A as an endotoxin. And then uh, gram-negative cells have a pore protein, protein porin or the porin proteins and they're a channel through that bilayer of the outer membrane. So when we look at the gram-positive cell walls compared to the gram-negative cell walls, thick peptidoglycan in the gram-positives, thin peptidoglycan in the gram-negatives, a rigid structure, and it's more rigid with the gram-positive than with the gram-negative cell, but it's also a rigid structure, just not as rigid. The cell wall is always rigid. Uh, the gram-positive cell walls have tachoic acid, no tachoic acid in the gram-negative cell walls, no outer membrane in the gram-positive cell wall, and an outer membrane with lipid A in the gram-negative cell walls. All right, any questions there? So what causes the gram stain mechanism? Will the crystal violet iodine complex forms in all cells? In the gram positive cells, the crystal violet iodine crystals do not leave the thick peptidoglycan. In the gram negative cells, the alcohol in the uh, decolorizing step dissolves the outer membrane and then washes 
the crystal violet iodine out of the thin peptidoglycan. The cells then stain pink because they take up uh, safranin, the counter stain. Uh, this table is showing you a very good comparison for the gram-positive cells and the gram-negative cells. Uh, you only need to know the very top of the table. You don't need to know any of the lower portion there. Uh, the outer membrane is absent in gram-positive cells, present in uh, gram-negative cells. Uh, there's lipopolysaccharide, high in presence in gram-negative, virtually none in the uh, gram-positive cells. All right, any question about any of that? Now, we've talked about the bacteria, and we've talked about them in general. I'm afraid now we have to talk about some atypical cell walls, meaning there are some bacteria that have, do not have the typical cell walls. And these we call atypical cell walls. The first I'm going to talk about is, of course, not even bacteria, archaea, the archaea bacteria. They do generally have cell walls, but they're not made of peptidoglycan. They are made of pseudomurine. It's another disaccharide. Or there are some that don't even have cell walls. Okay, so the archaea have different cell walls and they do not have peptidoglycan in them. That's probably all you need to know. Okay? And we expect them to be different because they're a different domain from domain bacteria. It's, uh, I don't know, surprising that the archaea do stain as gram-positive and gram-negative. And the archaea that are gram-positive have a thick cell wall. The archaea that stain as gram-negative have a thin cell wall. And what's happening is that the thickness of the cell wall of the archaea allows the uh, crystal violet iodine complex to wash out in the decolorizing step. And even though it's not peptidoglycan, it's pseudomurine, it seems to act the same in the gram stain. Okay? All right, any questions about the archaea? We won't talk much about the archaea in this class because none of the archaea cause human infections, at least that we know of today. Let's talk about two families of bacteria that have atypical cell walls. The first is the family mycoplasma, and they're called collectively the mycoplasmas. These, this family of bacteria lack cell walls, and the members of the species of this family tend to be pleomorphic because they lack cell walls. It's interesting to note that the mycoplasmas have sterols in their plasma membrane to give the plasma membrane support. And if you recall, that's exactly what animal cells do. For example, humans have the sterol cholesterol 
in our plasma membrane to give the plasma membrane support. The mycoplasmas have a sterol to give their plasma membrane support. Why the mycoplasmas do not need a cell wall is, is that they are uh, pathogens of animals and plants. And so they colonize uh, I'm not going to say lies, uh, that's the word I want to say uh, lytically neutral areas meaning um, areas which are isotonic they tend to colonize areas of plants and animals which are isotonic to them, their cells. And so they really don't need a cell wall for protection because they're colonizing isotonic areas. All right, any question about the mycoplasmas? Well, here's a question for you. When we stain the mycoplasmas with the gram stain, do they stain gram positive or do they stain gram negative? Okay, there's only two possible answers. The mycoplasmas, when they stain with the gram stain, do they stain gram positive or do they stain gram negative? Positive or negative? Negative, yes. They have no cell wall, so the uh, crystal violet will uh, wash out in the decolorizing step, and they stain as gram negatives. All right, let's move on to the next bacteria, uh, bacteria family, which has atypical cell walls. We've mentioned this before, the mycobacterium have atypical cell walls. And that's because they have a, mal, a lot of mycolic acids in their cell wall. Mycolic acid is a lipid, and there's so much mycolic acid in their cell wall that uh, water soluble molecules have a hard time getting through the cell wall. So the mycobacterium are atypical in the bacteria and it's because of mycolic acid being in their cell wall. Uh, the mycobacterium stain poorly in the gram stain because the uh, gram stain is a water-soluble dye. They usually do stain gram-positively because they are gram-positive cells. It's just a gram-positive cells with a bunch of mycolic acid added to it. Uh, but they do stain poorly, or at least not as well as most other gram-positive cells. They do readily take up acid fast stain, so we call the mycobacteria an acid fast cell, because they will take up the acid fast stain. And if you remember in the lab, the mycobacterium stain pinkish or red, reddish by, was it carbol fusion? And then the, uh, the uh, acid fast negative cells did not take up that stain, and they took up the counter stain, which was either blue or green. Uh, the blue would probably have been malachite, not malachite. Um, ah, I forgot the name of that stain now. Something blue. <laughs> 
For now, you can ignore the acid fast cells in the text. We will be talking about them later in the term, so it won't hurt you to read it, but you can ignore it if you wish. You can damage prokaryotic cells, like with penicillin, or by adding the enzyme lysosome, lysozyme, lysozyme, sorry, lysozyme can be found in a lysosome. That's why I get those terms confused. A lysozyme is an enzyme that digests the disaccharide in peptidoglycan. And I'm not going to ask you about, we call a gram-negative cell something different than a gram-positive cell when we get rid of the cell walls, like with the treatment of lysozyme. I've already mentioned that gram-positive cells are sensitive to penicillin G. Gram-negative cells are not because the penicillin G cannot get through the outer membrane. However, there are antibiotics which can work on gram-negative cells. And I pointed out that ampicillin, one of the early members of the penicillin family, I think it was the third member discovered. Okay, ampicillin. If it wasn't the third, it was the fourth. So it's one of the early ones. Can work on gram negatives. And ampicillin also works on gram positives. And then there's other antibiotics that can penetrate the outer membrane. Streptomycin, for example. This uh, antibiotic can get through the outer membrane because this is a lipid soluble antibiotic. All right, any questions on any of that? If not, we're going to move on to discussing the plasma membrane in greater detail. You'll recall that the plasma membrane is mostly made up of a phospholipid molecule, and it's a bilayer with the phosphate portions of the phospholipid being inside the bilayer, and then the phosphate heads being on the outer side of the bilayer and the inner side of the bilayer. So inside the, the uh, cell, we have the heads, which is the phosphate head of the uh, phospholipid. And then in the outer side of the cell, we once again have the heads of the phospholipid. So the lipid bilayer of uh, phospholipids is the main molecule of the cell wall but there are other molecules in it. Like in animal cells, we mentioned that there's cholesterol. That's not shown here. What is shown is, is that there are proteins in the cell membrane. There's three types of proteins. There are peripheral proteins, and they are a protein that is on one side or the other side of the membrane. So a peripheral protein is a protein that's on one side or the other side of the membrane. And then there are integral proteins and transmembrane proteins. And both of them uh, span the uh, lipid bilayer. The transport proteins are the most important protein spanning the cell membrane, and their purpose is to bring one molecule 
into or out of the cell. For example, glucose is brought into the cell. Any question about that? All right, if not, let's talk about the plasma membrane in a little more detail. It is a fluid about as thick as olive oil. And it's hard to think about it. When you're looking at my hand here, it's held together by a fluid. Meaning you're seeing the cell membrane, because I'm not a, a plant, I don't have a cell wall. And it's just always amazes me that my hand is held together by fluid, the cell membrane. There are phospholipids and proteins in the membrane. Uh, the proteins move to function. And uh, some of you have taken uh, A and P know that uh, when uh, ligands bind to the receptor proteins, the receptor proteins move together and then they'll be brought into the cell. Uh, the proteins move to function. The uh, proteins, oops, didn't mean to do that. Uh, the proteins that are in the cell membrane can move around literally uh, by, uh, what am I saying? Uh, they just float around by, uh, oh, uh, what do you call that? Like the drunks walk uh, randomly. Okay. Uh, not all proteins in the plasma membrane are free to move. They can be anchored either to the uh, uh, cytoskeleton or to some uh, external skeleton, like in bone, for example. The uh, protein could be anchored to the, what do you call that, the uh, bone tissue outside the cell. So not all proteins move. Some of them are anchored. They have to be anchored to either an external structure or to the cytoskeleton. But most of the proteins in the uh, cell membrane are free to move around. The phospholipids also rotate. Not only do they just spin, but they can move around and it's a fluid, so it's uh, believable that these molecules are moving. Uh, that is actually uh, how water gets into a cell uh, unless it's going through a transport protein. And that is, uh, it can't get through the lipid bilayer, but water is a small molecule. And when this phospholipid moves over, water can sneak in and then it just waits because it can't get through this layer but when this one moves over the water can now move through and that's the way water moves through the uh, lipid bilayer it doesn't move through easily but it can move through and of course for plants for example who want to bring up uh, water quickly into their cell, they will have a transport protein, like in the roots, and then bring the water into the cell, and then, I don't know, take the uh, water up the root, up to the cell, up to the scars, up to the plant. All right, the plasma membrane shows selective permeability it allows the passage of some molecules, but not others. No large molecules can move 
across the plasma membrane without the assistance of a transport protein. And this includes molecules like glucose and fructose, which really aren't that large, but also uh, amino acids, and then large molecules like proteins. They cannot move without the assistance of a transport protein. And then ions, like calcium plus ions, chloride negative ion, sodium ion, uh, even H plus ion, do not move or they move very slowly across the uh, lipid bilayer of the cell membrane. Lipid soluble molecules can move through the cell membrane. So if you're consuming oil, for example, you will get that moving into your cells because oil can move directly across the uh, bilayer of the cell membrane. However, if you think about uh, like a red blood cell in the, the blood, the majority of the blood is going to be water. There is not going to be that many oil molecules in the blood. Any question about that? The main molecules that can move across the cell membrane include oxygen and carbon dioxide. Oxygen, of course, moves into the cell. Carbon dioxide leaves the cell. And water can slowly move into the cell. All right, any question about any of that? Now, the plasma membrane in uh, bacteria, and actually all prokaryotes, has a few miscellaneous properties. For example, in the plasma membrane of all bacteria that make ATB, it is in the plasma membrane that the cells have the enzymes for making ATP. And we'll talk a little bit more about this later in the term. For photosynthetic bacteria, all the pigments that the bacteria have for engaging in photosynthesis are also found in the plasma membrane. Now, usually they are found in foldings of the plasma membrane, and we call these foldings chromatophores or thylakoids, and it is a part of the plasma membrane which is folded. It's folded to give the uh, uh, plasma membrane more surface area because the uh, cell is going to have a lot of uh, photosynthetic pigments and enzymes there to engage in photosynthesis. And that's why the cell folds the uh, plasma membrane. This is true also of the uh, cells uh, engaged in making ATP production that the uh, the uh, plasma membrane is folded to increase the surface area. Damage to the plasma membrane will allow leakage of the cell contents, and once the cytoplasm uh, starts leaving the cell, that uh, can kill the cell. It will kill the cell. That can happen with alcohol damaging the plasma membrane quaternary ammonium compounds damaging the plasma membrane, or polymyxin antibiotics. Polymyxin antibiotics put holes 
in the plasma membrane. Actually, they put holes in any membrane. Like it, it'll put holes in uh, the uh, outer membrane of a gram-negative cell as well, as well as the cell membrane. All right, any questions about any of that? We'll just uh, get started on this topic. I don't know if I can finish this topic before we run out of time. The movement of materials across membranes. For prokaryotes, we're talking about the movement of materials across the cell membrane. Uh, for animal membranes, uh, for animals, for example, it would be across both the cell membrane and then an organelle membrane. Uh, movement of materials across the plasma membrane is critical to cells. You have to have the molecules that the cell wants to come into the cell, and then the molecules the cell does not want, you want them to leave the cell. The cell has two processes for transferring the movement of material. The first is passive, and this, the molecule moves on its own. The cell doesn't spend any energy getting the molecule to move. A good example of that is oxygen. Oxygen moves into the cell passively. The cell doesn't need to expend any energy getting the oxygen it needs because it moves passively into the cell. And then carbon dioxide moves passively out of the cell. The other way, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about passive movement in a moment. Uh, the other way that uh, cells can get a molecule to move into the cell is by an active process. An active process, you move a molecule against its concentration gradient. For example, if you eat sweets, your cell is want to continue to move glucose into the cell. Well, what happens when the glucose becomes equal inside the cell to outside the cell. The cell is still going to want to move glucose into the cell because glucose is a very useful molecule for the cell. And so the cell doesn't just stop moving glucose once it becomes equal inside and outside the cell. It uses an active process to pump glucose into the cell against its concentration gradient. So if you eat a sweet, you're going to digest it all because down to the last molecule of glucose, it'll be pumped into the cell against the concentration gradient. And how does the cell do that? It spends energy to pump the molecule against its concentration gradient and for each molecule pumped into the cell, it will require one ATP molecule to move that molecule into the cell. Okay, any question about active processes to move molecules into the cell? All right, let's talk about passive processes in a little bit. And that is there are three different passive processes. There's simple diffusion, and that is when a solute moves across the uh, cell membrane. A uh, good example of a simple diffusion, as I mentioned, was oxygen moves across the plasma membrane by simple diffusion. And then carbon dioxide moves out of the cell by simple diffusion. 
the cell doesn't need to expend any energy because the molecules move naturally by simple diffusion. There's also facilitated diffusion. An example of facilitated diffusion is you eat a piece of fruit which has fructose. The cell is going to want to move the fructose into the cell. It needs a transport protein to do that. With fructose, which is why I'm choosing this one, fructose has a transport protein that operates by facilitated diffusion. The fructose concentration, as long as it is higher outside the cell than inside the cell, will transport the fructose into the cell without spending energy. And this is facilitated diffusion, a transport protein operating by facilitated diffusion. The trouble is, once the fructose concentration inside the cell equals outside the cell, no more fructose can be brought into the cell. So that means you'd never be able to digest all of the fructose. Now, it, of course, it's a little more complicated than that, and that is the cell can put the uh, fructose into the blood, the blood can uh, take the fructose and then slowly convert it to glucose, releasing the glucose into the blood. And so uh, it isn't just a simple story. My point is, is that more fructose can move into the cell because the cell is sending fructose to the blood. And then the blood is slowly, not the blood, the liver, uh, the blood takes the fructose to the uh, liver the liver then converts the uh, fructose to glucose, and then the glucose is slowly released. All right, any question about facilitated diffusion? Uh, there's a third way that passive processes can work where a molecule can move across the uh, cell membrane and that is by osmosis. Uh, osmosis is a solvent, not a solute. And rarely in living systems, we're only talking about water. So whenever we're talking about uh, osmosis, we're talking about the movement of water across the cell membrane. And that will happen passively water will move from areas of low concentration to areas, excuse me, water will move from areas of high concentration outside the cell to areas of lower concentration inside the cell. All right, here's a, uh, an example of simple diffusion. When you drop a dye into a beaker of water, the coloration from the dye will start to diffuse from the drop, as shown here. Movement from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration. Facilitated diffusion. Uh, this uh, example is showing you glucose it's actually uh, not a good, good example to talk about with glucose because uh, glucose, the transport protein, changes its behavior. And so I don't want to talk about glucose right now. I'll talk about fructose, and that is fructose has a transport protein which only operates as a facilitated diffusion. And then when fructose is higher outside the cell than inside the cell. Uh, the transport protein, without spending any energy, will move fructose into the cell. And the fructose will move into the cell 
until the concentration inside the cell and outside the cell uh, become equal. Oh, um, I generally call the protein a transport protein. Uh, this slide is calling it a transporter protein. It's the same thing. A transport protein is a transporter protein. It just moves one molecule into or out of the cell. All right, in both simple and facilitated diffusion, solutes are transported, and the transport is down a concentration gradient, meaning we move from areas of high to low concentration. Osmosis is different in that it's the net movement of water, which is a solvent, not a solute, across a selectively permeable membrane. And the water moves from areas of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Now remember, when the water is high in concentration, the solute in that area is low in concentration. And then where the water is lower in concentration, the solute will be higher in concentration meaning the solute concentration is the opposite of the water concentration. Any question about that? All right, if there's no questions about that, we're at a stopping point. So I'm gonna stop here. And I will see you in the lab at 6.30. All right, I will uh, see you. Thank you. All right. Come on.